kids. Now we are going to speak about the second part, which are the COVID monkeypox, the challenge of this epidemic posed to database like Ferrazone and what we did about it. And uh, what we did actually are very specific resources for SARS-CoV-2 monkeypox, but we are also for HIV, HPV, and some of the most important virus in terms of, of human impact. Um, so the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus uh, it is a RNA virus. It's a 30 kilobase genome. So it's the biggest genome of RNA uh, you get RNA viruses. About 28 proteins. And one of the first challenges is when the sequence came out uh, to annotate the, the proteome actually uh, in early January 2020. So the sequence came out and was available in GeneBank pretty quickly, actually. They were able to update and put that available very quickly. But for it to be available in, in Varzone, it could be as also pretty fast. But in Uniprot, you see it's kind of a problem because. There's a lot of program on complexity of annotation on, on proteins, which is not on nucleic acid, because nucleic acid pretty much find um, the open reading frame and it's annotated where for proteins, you get mm, thousands of things you could say about single protein uh, where when you know how, how to analyze it. So the first problem was, um, was to name actually the <laughs> open reading frame because the literature in the polyprotein of the COVID you have uh, one polyprotein, which is in two parts, and it be assembled by, by read through, uh, and other proteins which are assembled by subgenomic RNAs, uh, transcribed subgenomic RNAs. Um, some were called NSP for non structural, so uh, NSP8, 6, 7, but the other were also called in terms NSP because they were non structural. So well, you get NSP6, which was this one, but also this one. So we agreed very quickly with the scientific community that this should be called open reading frame, one to six, one to nine to 10, and uh, this would be called NSP. So there has been no um, problem. So uh, this was the first thing we had to do. Then we have to be sure of the gene model of the virus. And uh, you see, for example, uh, in GeneBank, they put the open reading frame 10, but we find no correlation, no, no, nothing similar in other coronaviruses. It was very small, and there is no subgenomic RNA. So we did not um, annotate it in, in Varzone or in Uniprot, but we annotated, for example, the RF9, which were presumed to exist and turn out to exist. RF10 turned out to be not transcribed, not expressed. And, uh, some people expressed it and find some would be functions, but actually it's not made at all in the virus. But this open only frame have functioned actually. So we made this work uh, before putting in viral zone. Um, then the, the virus have mutated a lot, you know, all about the variants. So mutations occurs by replication errors, but also by cellular editing enzymes. So um, the cell have a system to edit the RNA in the cytoplasm, which is kind of antiviral system because if you change the sequence of a viral genome, it will end up to be uh, non-viable. But if you doesn't kill it, it can make you stronger, like you said, Friedrich Nietzsche. And that's what happens in the COVID because we see from the transvection uh, that many mutations, for example, in Omicron or Delta came from this system so the virus exploits actually the defense of the host cell to uh, have more flexibility in the sequence. And the advent advantage is mostly to spread more and escape immunity. Um, I will skip that one. So the SARS-CoV-2 variants are, are nicely described, for example, in NextTrend, which is also a resource related to Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So making um, very clean and nice uh, phylogenetic analysis of all the sequence available, which is uh, millions now of sequences. And you see the different kind of, of lineages. For example, the last one are VQ1 and XBB, which are circulating uh, a lot in, in, in Europe and in the US, uh, but also a few others in, 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 um, in East Asia but Delta, Beta stopped to be uh, to circulating, for example. Uh, 
the big issue there uh, for, for doing the Verizon resource, for example, is the name of all the variants because Nextrem is using this naming system, which is very convenient. So you get 20 for the years and A, B, C, A, G, and so on. So for example, what we call the Delta is 21, 20 and I, G, A. Uh, Omicron is called 22 or 21, depending on the year it appeared. So this is one nomenclature of, of uh, lineages. What you have to know is that uh, International Committee of Taxonomy for Viruses is dealing with uh, general taxonomy, but not below the species. So every uh, naming system of lineage, whatever you want, uh, genotypes, serotypes, uh, named under the species, it's not covered by any official means. So everybody can do what they want, and that's what they do. Uh, this is a Pongo, which is a very important resource for uh, variants on, in coronaviruses. Uh, the way they name uh, the different lineage in uh, Omicron, so this is uh, the BA45. So don't read everything, of course, it's quite a mess. And this is BA2, okay? So you see, it's pretty completely different from what we use into, uh, into Nextprot, and it's much more detailed, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit uh, confusing uh, if you look at it at once. Then you have GZ, which is also naming differently an edge within different systems. So at the end of the day, we got Pongo, GZ, and next train uh, way of naming. Then came WHO, which gave name like Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Micron, uh, which is a pretty good thing. It's easier to under and make a, a kind of official way to name the variants because all of those are not official. It's each resource doing what they want. But W uh, HO has a, uh, an official posture and can really give insight into a, a more current way of naming. Um, then, for example, to put the variants into uh, into var zone and to provide the sequence, uh, but we need a sequence. We need a reference sequence, and that's also a big issue because um, W HO and where people give names to lineage, but they don't give sequence. And what people need very quickly, if you say there is a new Omicron virus, people will have to, to know at least one reference sequence. So if, if they want to study it, if they want to make a um, PCR to, to identify it in, in people, and anything you want uh, to do now is linked to the sequence. So you need to have a reference sequence. But in a lineage, many mutations occur. And not all of them are present all the time. So we kind of choose to to take mutations that are observed in more than 80% of sequences. So there is, um, there is um, a resource called outbreakinfo.com, which, which is uh, linked to um, uh, outbreakinfo, uh, to uh, just uh, not no.com, sorry, which is linked to GZ data. And they analyze the sequence and give you even the, the rate of sequence found into this lineage, for example, in peak, it's like 70% uh, of sequence have this variant. It's 100% of these uh, sequence have this variant in the Omicron, for example. So this is a way to give access to some, um, some mutation landscape of any kind of variants. Um, and it has been quite a difficulty to find reference sequence. So at the end of the day, we, uh, we make an agreement between the BVBRC and um, uh, US uh, Viper people, which provide also reference sequence on the next train and uh, other people in Los Angeles to agree on the same reference. So every resource, we display the same reference sequence for Omicron, for Delta, Alpha, and so on. And so it's to make it things more, uh, more comprehensive for, for users. So, We've made a resource I will show you uh, in Viral Zone about um, coronavirus and then a variance uh, page which describe uh, variations, links to Pongo, covariant, outbreak, next strain, uh, links to reference genomes and proteins so that people can get really hand on the sequence, not just only read the mutations uh, in the literature. Okay, so sh just showing you up that in live. So coronavirus resource we made. So we got the, the basic fact sheet, which is uh, 
knowledge of the virus with the genome. And we have a little bit more data on the, on the protein, how it's made, the polyprotein and interaction with membrane. This is kind of simple, but a lot of, of uh, people working in biology that jump on working on, on, uh, on coronavirus. So um, these people needed a lot more information to work with it. So we expanded the, the usual fact sheet for this virus. So we have more inside description of the protein, of how it's made the transcription in the virus, making subgenomic RNAs, a special sequence or how it works and we have a link to paper describing it if you really want to know. Um, we made a coronavirus life cycle, of course, I showed that before. Uh, we have links to the proteins in Uniprot um, and COVID resource, I will tell you a bit more, uh, in PDB as well, because pretty much all resource reacted to, to, to give uh, more information. So we have a um, kind of simple, I would say, interactome there, which we have interactions so shown for SARS-CoV-2, other were shown at first for SARS, we would say one for 2003. Um, so the different interaction for which we really have um, um, a good function, okay? So these are bisimilarities, but you have also some large scale interactome uh, available or some resource like Perus Hostnet, which gives uh, the interactome with thousands of, of proteins that could really uh, um, represent real interactions, but we are not sure yet, okay? Uh, we have made some uh, idea of the, the COVID earlier. So it's very simple way to, to, to show it, how it, it's working over time. Um, we analyzed a bit the vaccines. So what are the type of vaccines for this? So in the future, we will expand to many other viruses and maybe make pages on type of vaccines because we have so the new mRNA vaccines or, or they are made. Uh, there are like some mutations insert into the proteins there. Uh, uh, so, so the proteins is, is modified, or it is modified, or it is expressed, or it is presented uh, with pseudo uridine, for example, in the mRNA. Um, you get the dosage of the vaccination, global knowledge about it. For example, the another adenovirus vector vaccine it is made where I put the, the gene of SARS-CoV-2, how it is modified. You see it's more heavily modified in Jensen, than it is in AstraZeneca, for example. Inactivated vaccine, mostly used in China, how it works. Um, and subunit vaccine also, uh, Novavax. So pretty much all kind of vaccines uh, have been tried for, for coronavirus. And it allows us to make a bit, bit of description and give also for example, the Novavax use a lot of more mutants, so you get access to this information. It's not always easy to, to get. Um, now about antiviral drugs. Um, so um, on the replication cycle, you could find ways to block the virus at some part. And if you block the virus in one part of its cycle, it will be dead. Um, and you have different ways to do so. Uh, there are spike maturation inhibitors that have been tried, or endosomal fusion inhibitor, but uh, it turned out that the COVID could fuse at the plasma membrane in some cells, it could bypass this. Um, also, protease inhibitor, there is a polyprotein. If you prevent the virus from cleaving it, then you're okay. Polymerase inhibitor, the virus uses a special polymerase to replicate its RNA. Um, so you have different kind of, of uh, anti-inflammatory antibodies, different kind of, of ways to, to catch the virus and stop it. And here I've put a lot of description of what have main that have been tried because actually there are two sons of molecules that have been tried. Some of them are approved, like uh, this one, monopiravir and Vansivir, Tonavir, Paxlovid. Um, actually, well, they are pretty much weakly effective in clinical trial. Uh, most of them, it's not perfect yet, but it gives an inside. Uh, this page is hard to keep uh, updated because it moves very fast. Um, and I should timestamp it actually. So you will see that for some pages in var zone, like variants, so we go into it, that timestamp. So you know, last time it was updated because 
when the information can be changing a lot over time, uh, we don't have necessarily uh, the means to, to uh, keep the, term, the path of, of updating that every time. So you know uh, if, if the page is a bit outdated or not. So you see the last update is 20 January, so it's pretty close to now. <clears throat> um, so the variant page uh, have um, several things. Um, um, you have a 3D structure view directly into the page of the, the trimer of uh, spike protein, and you can uh, see directly on it because you can see that you are asparagine 540. So th this view gives you access to all the amino acids you want to. So you see the famous mutation, the first one that appeared in COVID was the T614G. You can see where it is. So this is a part of the protein which is on the membrane and this is a part exposed to, uh, to, the, um, the, uh, to, to the receptor that will bind the receptor and that will also interact mostly with antibodies. Uh, and you can see with the alpha, again, a lot of mutation all over the place, some in receptor binding. Um, up to the micron, if you see the delta, has a lot of mutation as well. And this part is mainly antibody escape. This is antibody escape on, on, on receptor binding. But when you go to Omicron, you see there is a lot of mutations going on now on many parts of the protein. Uh, and the last one is uh, XBB15, which is, uh, yeah you see all this mutation. So it's kind of nice to have a view on the 3D structure, even though what you really need if you want to work <laughs> with sequences. So here is a picture which describes on a linear way the different uh, mutations that are present at more than 80%. Like I told you before, because it's a lineage, there are many variants into the lineage. So we present the, the major mutations that are represent the lineage actually, but define the lineage. So for Micron, I just put the mutation defining the Omicron basic strain, and then you have uh, the special mutation for every kind of Omicron variants. So you have to adapt these two to really have Omicron and Alpha, Delta, Gamma. And then you have a, a list on a smart table in which you can have access to the, the Omicrons, uh, which are now circulating, but also the old lineage, uh, alpha, the B, the beta, delta, and so on. On this table, you have a um, link to Pongo, which is, for example, co lineage. So you have the lineage in Pongo, which should be describing, okay, the um, localization in the world and everything. So um, this link are convenient. You have covariant, which is Link to next train, which describe also the variants in other ways, using the same reference train that we are fully. Um, you have BBRC. So BBRC is a US website uh, public made for, for study of, of pathogens or so are virus and bacteria inside. And the part of us they give you also um, a lot of data on, on not only uh, virus on their genome, but also on variants of, of um, COVID. So you see, you have, so you have a representative strain link, which is the same in viral zone, but defining mutations. Um, so here in viral zone also show, uh, so I made it a drop down menu because there are a lot of mutations, it's, it's not easy to scroll. They are the name synonym of, so we call that the way using Pongo, uh, but it's 21 key. K, K, sorry, in, uh, in next train, or uh, it was named previously like this, which was a bit complicated, now it's BA1. You have access to the genome here. So the kind of reference genome I told you we struggled to, to agree on and then we display on a different resource. So this is the gene bank country with all the genome. So now uh, if people need to, they can really access to the direct sequence of um, um, one of the best reference we choose. We choose um, the reference at the basis of, um, of the outbreak it makes, so at the basis of the tree, so that it's one of the first, so it should cover um, 
better wool diversity that will happen later. Because if we take a later diverse sequence, it could not cover all the, the lineage. Uh, and also, you get access to spike protein because it was the most studied protein in the COVID, also from GeneBank. Okay, because they are not always present in uh, Uniprot. I will tell you, Uniprot takes a long time to, to update uh, when uh, GeneBank is very quick. So at the time, we, we make, for example, the XBB1, which is there. The spike protein is not yet in Uniprot. So we didn't target it there. Okay, um, so this is for the variants. Um, let's go back to this. Um, we also put annotation of variants into, we push it into Swiss plot. So in the Swiss plot code of spike, we have a line of variants with the name on uh, all the code. So it, it appears in uh, in the Swiss plot as well, Uniprot, and people can really pass this data directly from the database if they want to, because it's there. But again, it's a challenge to release quickly in Uniprot. Um, so to, to make something about COVID, when, when the COVID pop out in, in January, a sequence of COVID pop out in January 2020, we make the annotation very quickly, analyze the proteome, and it was uh, like two weeks, we have everything ready. But uh, Uniprot will not be released at that time before April 2020, which is a pretty long way when <laughs> the new virus is eating the world. So um, um, Uniprot decided to make a special part of website, which is uh, an early website to see the, the entries. So Uniprot is a very big boat with a lot of, of uh, annotations or program working at every release. So we could not really uh, steer the boat toward the COVID, but we could make a, a sister website just for the COVID in which we release just these entries. Um, and that's what they do. And it's a COVID-19 Uniprot website in which you have the latest annotations. Or, and they are, um, they are at, at every release of Uniprot, they're released right away. So they are like in every two months, they are updated. Um, which is pretty much the best we can do with all the complexity of uh, Uniprot. But uh, as you see, the, the new pandemic posed a new uh, question to, to this big database is how do you update? How can you provide the right data that people need at the right moment? Um, I think uh, maybe we could do it better uh, if there's a new one, uh, but we are learning a lot. <clears throat> So um, now there are um, 11 millions of SARS-CoV-2 genome. Well, it was in May, no, now it may be uh, like 15 millions, I don't know, deposited in GZ. Um, also, it's a bit uh, complexity because people depose in GZ, which is uh, not a public, um, um, public database. It's owned by a foundation. Uh, and then some are pushed in the NSDC database, which is a public gene bank, uh, gene bank, DDPG, uh, share in the world. So uh, there was about 5 million, which is already a lot, actually. Um, so you see the number of genome submission per country. Uh, well, it's not the same. Some countries are, some, are sequencing and submitting more than others in, in gene bank, I mean. Um, and in GZ also. So, there are more submission uh, all over the world. Okay, Switzerland actually is submitting to both database because we are uh, um, database made by Swiss uh, Institute of Bioinformatics that gather every sequence for Switzerland and push it into GeneBank and GZ. So uh, everybody is happy about that. Um, okay, now about the monkeypox virus. So uh, again, we have. Uh, new uh, emerging virus, which is monkeypox, a pox virus we did not have in human since the variola was eradicated. So it's much more complex virus. You see it's a two, it's a DNA virus, one of the biggest virions uh, we know already. You see the SARS size compared to monkeypox particle. It, it's much, much more bigger. Um, <clears throat> and it's a 200 KB genome <laughs> and about 200 200 proteins encoded by, by it in a complex way. 
Um, so we have made a lot of previous work with experts uh, about PoxVirus biology that we have leveraged to, to create also um, a very quick um, monkeypox specialized resource. Uh, so for example, the variant of monkeypox or pox viruses is pretty complex, two layers, two membranes, a lot of proteins. So for example, SARS, uh, you get one protein at the surface of the virus, okay, just one. The spike, uh, just another one besides, it's kind of two. But here you have more than 20 proteins in the mature variant and even more in the developed variant. So it's much more complicated. The receptor is bound by this complex, which is made of uh, maybe 10 proteins. Um, and uh, so we we uh, we had uh, established that in 2016. So we, we put that into the, the resource so that people can understand at least the complexity of the variant of the receptor binding and see it's quite different virus than, for example, coronavirus. If you want to study it, it's definitely not the same. Um, so we have made a post virus resource that I can show you up. Um, zone. It's there. So again, the classical fact sheet we had already before. And then, for example, I, uh, we draw um, a genome. So you see the genome is much more complex. There was also a lot of problem to name the genes because in virology, where there is no uh, standard to naming genes and proteins at all. There's no consumption. People are doing uh, naming the virus, the sequence, the way actually they want. So. We have a huge problem of uh, diversity, and especially it happened in pox viruses. Every kind of vaccine have different way of naming uh, their genes. They were based on uh, different regions, uh, which are cleaved by um, restriction enzymes, and then a number. But as uh, these viruses have a genetic plasticity, they recombine, they change the way of genes are organized. We ended up with many genes that were similar and completely different names in. Uh, even in vaccine viruses. So now there are, um, it was agreed to put an official nomenclature of genes recently, so we use that. Uh, and this, this picture shows you the old nomenclature and the new one, so it can be easier to link between uh, um, <clears throat> the literature, the old literature, and know what we are talking about. So you see the genome also, it's colored to the main functions we have. Actually, pretty much all genes in the viruses could be classified. Some are made for genome replication or transcription, so in blue. And you see in uh, box viruses, it's pretty much in the center of the genome. Some for assembly and budding in green, so it's disseminated in center, or surface proteins in yellow. But also you have host modulation protein, which are represented on peak. And you see that the extremities of the box virus are full of host modulation protein. And this is where the genetic plasticity comes really. They can change, exchange, get new genes and delete genes, modify them very quickly in these extremities. Um, so as to, uh, to change easily between hosts and to adapt to hosts as well. So this is a genome. We also have some interactions of the box virus. Uh, you see, the main interaction described again for, for clear function that we identified. So you have the name of the gene, old nomenclature, new nomenclature, OPG, and where they are actually um, acting, uh, what function they are doing. We have so the, a list in which you can access to the proteins or their pop-ups also for a summary of, of what is in, in the, um, the database. So you have vaccinia, because vaccinia is pretty much annotated, a lot of work has been made, made in the last 30 years on vaccinia proteins, monkeypox kind of new in the block, so we find less, less data and function in the monkeypox entries and in the vaccinia, so we put two together because they are homologs. <coughs> and um, also the host protein they are interacted with, here, uh, for example, uh, ETFR, and this one, this is a viral AGFR. <clears throat> and uh, there are some models also make of, of GOCAM, so it's gene ontology made uh, model um, that describe on 
pretty much large um, pathway of interaction between different things. So it's more like um, a bioinformatic things, but could be pretty easy to read and, and uh, can be reusable by computers and uh, artificial intelligence. So it, it's kind of where we, we go between the, the literature of, of interaction up to the bioinformatics in it. So for interactions, uh, of course, life cycle that was made with expert um, a few years ago. It's pretty much the same, monkeypox, vaccinia, structural protein I show you, uh, the antiviral drugs. So there are already existing antiviral drugs. You see, uh, see the three most used and known, uh, and you have two kinds of drugs. So again, when you stop the cycle somewhere, you kill the virus. Often you need to stop the cycle at different parts because the virus could evade just one push, like for HIV. One leads to make strain as well, in which you can see the monkeypox circulating. This is the new lineage that came out in the world. And so far, monkeypox have been getting down after, after infecting a lot of people over the world. It's still present, but in many countries, it kind of goes down the new infections. Unfortunately, did not mutate much, so we hope it will remain so. Okay, and so this is what I wanted to tell you about um, about this this resource. You can see that we made also the first one we made was for hepatitis B. So I told you the hepatitis virus are pretty small, but they have to go. Uh, through uh, liver and endothelial sinusoidal cells, which are very small holes. So a big virus like adeno or Ebola could not really reach um, the, the hepatocytes. It's kind of filter. And maybe it's not a surprise that hepatitis virus are one of the smallest, so they can really reach the, the cell they target. Um, so again, so some, some replications in which you have links to, uh, for example, the HPV surface protein. So more details on, on this virus, again, for herpes, uh, like for example, the virion is pretty complex. So again, like we met for pox, we have a description, one of the best description of virion. It's very complex, I'm not really sure how they interact, but trying to make sense of uh, the literature here. And HIV resource also, that would make in collaboration with the Swiss South Africa joint program. Uh, some people in Tulio uh, de Oliveira, for example, in South Africa, we work with him to do that because he's been working a lot of HIV. Uh, so again, user suspects the drugs, some interactions. So we get a lot of interaction that has been showed up with a rating of how sure we are, which really are the functions. Sometimes it's not really it's just one paper. But uh, some sites can give you uh, like thousands of interactions or even like 10% of human genome interacting with HIV, which I don't believe is really uh, true. But it's, it's what uh, large scale interatomics gives you as a result. So it's raw data. Okay, and um, I think it's, it's over for this presentation, but for our Zoom. So now it's time to uh, thank people in the team working. So Eduardo Castro is a programmer making very nice work to, to create new things. You pop up everything, it makes JavaScript and everything is made by him. Chantal Hilo is the first team annotator with which we funded, we, we, we created the Varzone in the first place. And Patrick Masson is also a virus annotator. Um, which help a lot, in, especially in um, cross-virus interaction. Uh, we are working in the Swiss Pod Group under the direction of Alan Bridge. And I want to thank a lot of collaborators over the years that um, help us to develop the, the resource. Uh, there are more than that, I can see everybody. And um, I thank you very much for your...